Hello, and welcome to Prairie Pulse. Coming up a little bit later in the show, we'll hear music from Andrew McFarland. But first, joining me now is our guest, Executive Director of the North Dakota Museum of Art in Grand Forks, and uh, Matthew Wallace, of course. Matthew, thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having me. As we get started, Matthew, we always ask folks, tell us a little about yourself and maybe where you're originally from and your background. Sure, sure. So I grew up, uh, my family had a little farm in, uh, near Warwick, North Dakota, which is um, 20, 25 miles south of Devil's Lake, and uh, you know, attended school out there, and um, ultimately uh, went to UND, and uh, after kind of bouncing around to from major to major, I settled in uh, English and uh, got my, uh, my BA from UND in literature. Okay. So. Well, you recently took over the reins at the museum. Uh, when did you take over and how are things going so far? Uh, this is my second week on the job. <laughs> I mean, I started, uh, I think the official date was Mar March 15th. So um, very, very fresh to this, but I've, I've been with the museum since um, 2004. So I've been there for a number of years. What role did you have prior to the the executive director. Sure, I was. Uh, I started as the director of Rural Arts Initiative, which is a state-funded program through the state legislature. Um, in 2004, they came up with a, a little bit of money for us to um, s investigate um, bringing arts into rural communities around the state. So um, the, it started, in, like I said, in 2004, where we would curate exhibitions and take them to little towns all over. North Dakota, and the size really didn't matter. It could be 80 people or, or 5,000 people, and we would install these exhibitions in these communities, and they would stay there for about two weeks and become their community project. And then uh, two to three weeks later, we'd come back, we'd pack that show up, take it to another town, and install them you know, wherever the community had space. So it could be in a empty storefront. It could be the very first place we ever installed a show, I think in 2004, was um, the Masonic Temple in Crosby, North Dakota. And if anybody's been to Crosby, you know, you get up to the northwest corner of the state and you look over here and you can see Canada and you look over here and you can see Montana. So it's, it's way up in the corner. And, uh, but just a wonderful little community and a great way to kick off that program. So, yeah. Well, of course you took over for a longtime executive director, uh, museum founder, I believe, mm -hmm. Laurel Ruder. Can you talk about her legacy? Oh, absolutely. I think if anyone uh, knows Laurel, knows that she has put uh, 50 years of her life into building the arts in North Dakota. And, uh, you know, what a humbling position to get into because knowing um, all that she has done, um, you know, starting the museum from a student gallery and taking it to what it is today, um, Laurel has had a global impact on, on the arts. And I've been very fortunate enough to to travel with her and be a part of exhibitions that she's taken around and, and brought to, to um, North Dakota as well. Um, and one time in particular, uh, we were in a, um, a theater in New York and uh, we walk in and the gentleman handing program says, looks and he looks, he looks again and finally says, Laurel Reuter? And she turns and says, yes. Oh, I've always wanted to meet you. I'm, you know, so you never knew who uh, who you would run into to that would knew, know Laurel. So yeah. So go back to how was the museum founded, and of course when? Sure. sure. So um, Laurel started it in the 1970s. She was a graduate student in the English department at UND, and my understanding is uh, the the her uh, advisor and and the head of the student union said, "Hey, we have a little extra money. What would you like to do with this?" And she said, "Well, why don't we start a student gallery up on the third floor?" And so it started as a student gallery on the third floor and um, slowly expanded into um, what we are today. But in between there, um, we moved over to the women's gymnasium. So in the, probably in the late 80s, early 90s, um, the women's gymnasium was not being used and uh, they brokered a deal with UND. If they got the money to do the renovations, they could use the, the facility as a museum. So uh, an architect was hired out of Albuquerque and came in and redesigned the whole building. And uh, in 1989, I believe it was, 1990, they moved into that space. Um, and then, you know, in 1996, uh, the museum um, s separated from the university and became a private not-for-profit, as, so, as we are today. Okay, so what is the role and the mission mm -hmm. of the North Dakota Museum of Art? Well, and the, and the, uh, the, the, one of the things that the museum focuses on is bringing 
or developing this conversation between you know national and international artists and our audience and and bringing exhibitions that we may not see um, in the state to North Dakota so um, showing contemporary work and uh, kind of by that we mean you know for the most part 1970s to today and and living artists you know some artists who are still living that's not to say we we do not show uh, exhibitions by artists who have passed away because we certainly do that as well but our primary focus is is bringing contemporary artwork here and um and that can be you know highlight our original artists as well so mm -hmm. so what exhibits are currently on display and maybe what are some of the future exhibits you mm -hmm. have sure um right right now we have uh, an exhibition called From the Collection of Anonymous. And this is a gentleman who has purchased over, I want to say about 100 artworks for the museum's permanent collection. And we just like to be anonymous in this endeavor. And uh, probably over the last 10 years has purchased around 100 works of art for the museum. Um, so we are showing a portion of, of those works right now, and that's prints and, and it's paintings and some sculpture as well. So it's a really diverse, um, body of work. Um, we also just opened up an exhibition by Jim Dow, who's a photographer out of Boston. And uh, Jim is known for, uh, one, one of the things he's known for is his commission, the museum commissioned him starting in 1981 to photograph folk art in North Dakota because we were doing an exhibition, um, but much of the work was too big and too permanent to move to North Dakota. So um, Jim came in and um, spent the next 20 years coming and going starting photograph folk art and then moving to architecture, you know, those things that people make in their, their shops in the winter time, uh, snow, uh, hay bale sculptures, uh, so on and so forth. Um, so we're opening that exhibition of his work um, this week. And then, of course, upstairs in the mezzanine gallery is a permanent exhibition. Um, and it's called Barton's Place. And Barton was an artist who showed uh, in, in North Dakota in 1989. He came here for his first exhibition of the new space and um, fell in love with the state. And over this 30-year uh, friendship he had with Laurel, um, they'd all had these conversations about what he was going to do with his New York apartment. You know, he had uh, you know, a brother, but that was, that was it in the family. And it was filled from top to bottom with African artwork and um, animals and all kinds of, of curiosities. And so I think uh, one evening um, with those two getting together, they decided they would just move the whole apartment to North Dakota. And it would be this 21st century artist studio. So people could see how a uh, New York uh, artist was living at the time. So um, when Barton passed away in 2012, we went out. Um, I'd say probably about six or eight staff members went out, packed up his apartment into two trucks, um, drove it back to North Dakota, and installed it as it was when he passed away. So that's, that's an exhibition you'll always find up in the mezzanine gallery. Yeah, sure. Well, for nearly 50 years, uh, you've been in business, so to speak. Uh, what are some of the most important exhibits that have been on display at the museum? Sure, sure. Um, one that always comes to mind for me is uh, an exhibition that uh, Laurel had curated um, called The Disappeared, which was an exhibition about the people who disappeared under military dictatorships throughout South and Central America. Um, so this exhibition probably contained 20 to 30 artists from, I think, six or seven different countries. And um, we open it here in Grand Forks. Um, 14 of the artists uh, came and then um, it was supported in part by the Lannan Foundation out of uh, Santa Fe and they they supported the touring of the exhibition so um, I was fortunate enough with a few other staff members to go to five places in South America and help install the show there so we did a, a big international tour and then um, I came back and did five cities in the US as well and I think one of the uh, greatest things that ever came out of this was the New York Times review of that um, while it was in New York City. And uh, they just said, you know, why is this exhibition coming from a, a curator in North Dakota and not one of our own? And, you know, it was, um, he sort of put it out there that, you know, we need to start paying attention to what's going on in this place in North Dakota. So. Well, great. Uh, uh, so let's talk about some of the programs maybe you have. Do you have an arts program for children? Yeah, we're we're just gearing up for that right now. I mean, it's been a hard two years with with COVID, and sure. and you know, I think people were getting burnt out of trying to do classes online, and probably had enough of that. So everyone's kind of uh, looking forward to this. But we do uh, eleven weeks uh, of children's art camps, 
And so um, nine to three every day, you go for a week straight. Um, and then, you know, when that one's over, a different artist comes in and teaches a different class. And those usually sell out very quickly. Um, and then during the, the winter time, what we have is something called Family Day, in which it's uh, one Saturday a month, and it's uh, free and open to the public. You know, parents or, or grandparents can come in, and we set up uh, art-making stations based on exhibitions. And so there's about six different activities that you can do, and just from 10 to 12. And so there's just something to get, get the family out of, of the house in the winter time and provide something for them to, to get them through these long winter days. Sure. What about your artist uh, res residency program? Yeah, so that was, um, we have a place called McKenna House. And McKenna, <coughs> it was a town um, north of Laramore, started by the McKenna family. And uh, Mrs. McKenna was a supporter of the museum. And so she would spend three months a year volunteering in the spring um, while she was here. And she left her, um, uh, her farmstead to the museum. And uh, the house is, it's in a 1920s, uh, built in 1920s, designed by the architect de Reemers. Um, so he's also an architect who did the state capitol and many, many buildings around North Dakota. And she wanted it to be an artist in residence program. So we open it in the summer and artists come um, starting in June and go through October and stay for two to three weeks at a time. Um, just enjoying that solitude and quietness and just making art and developing projects and so on. Mm -hmm. Uh, let's talk about some of the things you've got at the, at the museum there. What is the Garden Path? Garden Path was something we started a few, oh, I don't know, maybe five, six years ago. Um, these were, were stone paths laid out and as a way of generating um, general operating, you know, that's always the hardest thing to, uh, to, um, to fundraise for. You know, grants are often um, kind of centered around programming, but no one really wants to pay for someone to run those programs. So what we did was he, uh, we had these stones donated and they, go, they circle around the entryway of the museum and guests can pick a stone that they want um, and give us an image and we'll take it and have it um, engraved with that image or word or name or whatever they want. However, it's sort of a memorial to how, you know, someone in their family or themselves. And um, then we take that money and we put it into an endowment in which you can use that, uh, the proceeds from that endowment to uh, help uh, pay for salaries and other sort of general operating expenses. Sure. Well, so how many employees do you have and, and how are you funded? You, you... Yeah, yeah, good question. Um, right now we are, uh, we, we Went to five, um, now we've kind of made a few more hires and I think we're up to seven. We have, um, our cafe is back up and running again, so we just hired a new chef, uh, all new wait staff, um, so they're part of the, uh, the museum team as well. And we often say like, you know, people come to the, the museum to see the artwork, but then they go and have lunch, or they come to the, the cafe and then go and see the artwork. So we really try to integrate both the cafe and uh, what we do in the galleries together. Mm -hmm. So. And uh, talk about your permanent collection. Mm -hmm. What's in the permanent collection? So right now we have, um, I'm guessing it's about 2,500 artworks. And it's, uh, it is everything from paintings to sculptures to um, ceramic pots to quilts. Um, it really just runs the gamut. Um, some of the work that uh, we come in after, you know, Barton, I was telling Barton Benish when he passed away, um, I wanted to leave his apartment to the museum. He, one of the things, one of the reasons why he did that, he said, because there was no African artwork in North Dakota at that time. And he wanted his African artwork to be a place, uh, or, or his apartment to be a place where people could experience African artwork. And um, so with that, we've had a few more gifts, and I think we've grown that collection of African artwork to about 350 pieces. Um, we have, um, like I said, extensive ceramics, but it comes from artists regionally, um, locally, and nationally and internationally. So usually when we do a show, we, we try to purchase a few pieces from the artists as well um, for the collection, and, and that way they're, they're there forever, and you know, it's a, uh, it's a win-win for both the museum and for, and for the artists. You know, we often hear about a permanent collection. You know, how is it decided what's gonna be a permanent collection for sure. a museum? Sure, yeah. Um, so we've had a, uh, a collection committee and we look at you know if it fits w what we we want to collect, and that's that's you know living artists, and that's uh, you know artists who are are you know working day in and day out right now, artists that we've shown. Um, so we really want to highlight you know um, 
our, our local and regional artists as well. So we've got a very extensive collection from them. Um, but, you know, as we say, we also focus on international and national exhibitions and artists. And so whenever we can work that out, um, that we can, you know, get a piece into the collection, um, we'll do that. So, for example, next exhibition we have coming up is an exhibition called Hanging Tree Guitars. And this is uh, out of North Carolina. And it is a uh, folklorist and photographer who uh, kind of spends his time promoting and, and um, aiding um, old blues musicians that have fallen through the cracks. And one of those musicians is a gentleman by the name of Freeman Vines, who is a guitar maker and a visual artist and, and musician. And uh, Mr. Vines was given rough cut slabs of wood from a known lynching tree out of North Carolina. Mm -hmm. and he wanted to provide a voice for the, the, the person who was lynched in this tree by the, you know, at this time. And um, so he, he took these and he started making guitars out of them. And he was also interested in a very particular sound. And he says he's never been able to recreate that sound, but he's been working on this. And um, the photographer will, uh, has done a lot of uh, great photographs of, of his work and, and the area and whatnot. So um, when we open that show, we'll take a print from him. We're going to purchase a, uh, a print for our collection in exchange for him coming up and giving a lecture. So. Okay. We're out of time, but if people want more information, where can they go? Yeah. Um, museum's website, nd, what is it, ndmoa.com. All right. Yeah. Matthew, thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Stay tuned for more. Andrew McFarland is a true musician who composes, arranges, and performs. His instruments of choice are guitar and bass guitar, but his studies at Minnesota State University Moorhead have provided him with a strong musical foundation.
Well, that's all we have on Prairie Pulse this week. And as always, thanks for watching. Funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4th, 2008 and by the members of Prairie Public.